Welcome to A Year of War and Peace. I'm your host, Brian E. Denton. A Year of War and Peace is a daily, year-long, chapter-by-chapter reading of and meditation on Leo Tolstoy's epic novel, War and Peace. In these videos and podcasts, you'll be treated to a free reading of one chapter per day of the novel, plus a reflective essay I've written individually tailored to that day's chapter. These readings are offered for free, though if you'd like to support me, you can do so in one of three ways. First, you could purchase my ebook, A Year of War and Peace. It features the entire novel, plus all of my reflective essays, and it's only $2.99 on Amazon.com. You could also become a patron at patreon.com slash Brian E. Denton. If you sign up there, you'll receive a sonnet once a month, plus a link to an ebook of my collected sonnets. Finally, if you like, you can make a one-time donation to my PayPal account. The email there is brianedenton at gmail.com. You can also use that email to contact me. I'd be happy to hear from you. Your support is greatly appreciated. Today's reading and reflection is on chapter 278. Chapter 278. The Russian army was commanded by Kutuzov and his staff, and also by the emperor from Petersburg. Before the news of the abandonment of Moscow had been received in Petersburg, a detailed plan of the whole campaign had been drawn up and sent to Kutuzov for his guidance. Though this plan had been drawn up on the supposition that Moscow was still in our hands, it was approved by the staff and accepted as a basis for action. Kutusov only replied that movements arranged from a distance were always difficult to execute. So fresh instructions were sent for the solution of difficulties that might be encountered, as well as fresh people who were to watch Kutusov's actions and report upon them. Besides this, the whole staff of the Russian army was now reorganized. The posts left vacant by Bagration, who had been killed, and by Barclay, who had gone away in dungeon, had to be filled. Very serious consideration was given to the questions whether it would be better to put A in B's place and B in D's, or on the contrary, to put D in A's place, and so on, as if anything more than A's or B's satisfaction depended on this. As a result of the hostility between Kutusov and Benningsen, his chief of staff, the presence of confidential representatives of the emperor in these transfers, a more than usually complicated play of parties, was going on among the staff of the army. A was undermining B, D was undermining C, and so on in all possible combinations and permutations. In all these plottings, the subject of intrigue was generally the conduct of the war, which all these men believed they were directing. But this affair of the war went on independently of them, as it had to go. That is, never in the way people devised, but flowing always from the central attitude of the masses. Only the highest spheres did all these schemes, crossings, and interminglings appear to be a true reflection of what happened. Prince Michael Ilyanarovich wrote the emperor on the 2nd of October in a letter that reached Kutusov after the Battle of Taurutino. Since September 2, Moscow has been in the hands of the enemy. Your last reports were written on the 20th, and during all this time not only has no action been taken against the enemy, or for the relief of the ancient capital, but according to your last report, you have even retreated further. Serpukov is already occupied by an enemy detachment at Tula, with its famous arsenal so indispensable to the army, and it's in danger. From General Witzengorodi's reports, I see that an enemy corps of 10,000 men is moving on the Petersburg Road. Another corps of several thousand men is moving on Dmitrov. A third has advanced along the Vladimir Road, and a fourth, rather considerable detachment, is stationed between Rusa and Mozask. Napoleon himself was in Moscow as late as the 25th. In view of all this information, when the enemy has scattered his forces in large detachments, and when Napoleon and his guards in Moscow, is it possible that the enemy's forces confronting you are so considerable as not to allow your taking of the offensive? On the contrary, he is probably pursuing you with detachments, or at most with an army corps much weaker than the army entrusted to you. It would seem that availing yourself of these circumstances, you might advantageously attack a weaker one and annihilate him, or at least oblige him to retreat, 
retaining in your hands an important part of the provinces now occupied by the enemy, and thereby averting danger from Tula and other towns in the interior. You will be responsible if the enemy is able to direct a force of any size against Petersburg to threaten this capital in which it has not been possible to retain many troops. For with the army entrusted to you, and acting with resolution and energy, you have ample means to avert this fresh calamity. Remember that you have still to answer to our offended country for the loss of Moscow. You have experienced my readiness to reward you. That readiness will not weaken in me, but I and Russia have a right to expect from you all the zeal, firmness, and success which your intellect, military talent, and the courage of the troops you command justify us in expecting. But by the time this letter, which proved that the real relation of the forces had already made itself felt in Petersburg, was dispatched, Kutuzov had found himself unable any longer to restrain the army he commanded from attacking, and a battle had taken place. On the 2nd of October, a Cossack, Shapovalov, who was out scouting, killed one hare and wounded another. Following the wounded hare, he made his way far into the forest and came upon the left flank of Murat's army, and camped there without any precautions. The Cossack laughingly told his comrades how he had almost fallen into the hands of the French. A cornet, hearing the story, informed his commander. The Cossack was sent for and questioned. The Cossack officers wished to take advantage of this chance to capture some horses, but one of the superior officers, who was acquainted with the higher authorities, reported the incident to a general on the staff. The state of things on the staff had of late been exceedingly strained. Ermolov, who had been to see Benningson a few days previously and had entreated him to use his influence with the commander-in-chief to induce him to take the offensive. If I did not know you, I should think you did not want what you were asking for. I need only advise anything, and his highness is sure to do the opposite, replied Benningson. The Cossack's report, confirmed by horse patrols who were sent out, was the final proof that events had matured. The tightly coiled spring was released, the clock began to whir, and the chimes to play. Despite all his supposed power, his intellect, his experience, and his knowledge of men, Kutusov, having taken into consideration the Cossack's report, a note from Benningsen, who sent personal reports to the emperor, the wishes he supposed the emperor to hold, and the fact that all the generals expressed the same wish, could no longer check the inevitable movement and gave the order to do what he regarded as useless and harmful, gave his approval, that is, to the accomplished fact. All right, that concludes my reading of chapter 278. I will now proceed to my reflection on the same. A Year of War and Peace, Day 278, on Kutusov. Kutusov is, alongside Platon Karetiev, one of two individuals in Tolstoy's epic whose presentation is more caricature than character. This isn't a bad thing, necessarily. It's intentional, actually. The novel is rich with well-rounded, dynamic characters. These are the characters who are as mirrors to our own muddled, confused, and multifaceted lives. Kutusov and Platon, however, serve a different purpose. They are didactic creations, ministering wisdom to fellow fictional characters and readers alike. Platon Karetiev represents the earthy, simple life. Kutusov, on the other hand, is more high-minded, big-picture, and cosmic. One could say Kutusov is the Marcus Aurelius to Platon Seneca. Today the fruit of Kutusov's wisdom of restraint and acceptance of providential direction ripens as the Russian army finally moves against the French. Ever since the Battle of Borodino, Kutusov has been pushed towards opening up an attack on the French. He has resisted that call. He has resisted popular opinion. He has resisted calls from his fellow generals and also the demands from his emperor. All along the way, he has rested easy in those words of wisdom once imparted to Prince Andrew so many chapters ago. The strongest of all warriors are these two, time and patience. As the war comes to an end, 
take notice of the outcomes for the dueling leaders of Napoleon and Kutuzov. Napoleon, ever eager to impose control upon the world, suffers a humiliating defeat in retreat. Kutuzov, on the other hand, emerges victorious largely as a result of patient endurance of those things he has no control over and wise, virtuous exercise of those things he does have control over. Daily Meditation All those things at which thou wishest to arrive by a circuitous road, thou canst have now, if thou dost not refuse them to thyself. And this means, if thou wilt take no notice of all the past, and trust the future to providence, and direct the present only conformably to piety and justice. Conformably to piety, that thou mayest be content with the lot which is assigned to thee. For nature designed it for thee, and thee for it. Conformably to justice, that thou mayest always speak the truth freely and without disguise, and do the things which are agreeable to law, and according to the worth of each. And let neither another man's wickedness hinder thee, nor opinion, nor voice, nor yet the sensations of the poor flesh which has grown about thee. For the passive part will look to this. Marcus Aurelius, Meditations. All right, so that concludes my reading of and reflection on chapter 278 of War and Peace. I really hope you enjoyed it. Thanks so much for listening. Remember that if you'd like to support me, you can do so either by purchasing the ebook. A Year of War and Peace, becoming a patron at patreon.com, or making a one-time donation to PayPal. The links to all that are down below in the show notes description. Tomorrow, we're going to be reading and reflecting on chapter 279. I hope you'll join me. Until then, take care of yourselves and others.